Now, joining me now is a scientist whose quest is to find a drug that will effectively treat the brain-eating amoeba. Uh, please welcome Dennis Kyle, PhD. Dr. Kyle is a distinguished professor at the University of South Florida's College of Public Health. Dr. Kyle, welcome to the show, sir. Oh, thank you for having me. Oh, glad to have you. Um, now, as I said in the introduction, the treatment of Neglaria fowleri has been and continues to be uh, largely unsuccessful. What is it about this free-living amoeba that makes it so difficult to kill? Well, we don't know much about it. Uh, very few people have been working on trying to come up with new treatments. All the all the drugs that are currently used in combination uh, came from other sources, uh, antifungals or anti-cancer drugs. There's never been a, a concerted effort to actually identify drugs that specifically target these amoeba. So just basically because there hasn't been the research because it's essentially a really rare pathogen. I, I think it's, uh, we don't like to use the word rare. I think when you use rare, people mm -hmm. get the feeling that they don't have to worry about it. Uh, the truth is that this amoeba is very common in warm water, especially right. in the southern states, but it can be in warm water in other places in the world, geothermal pools or any sort of heated water. So people really should be aware that this is a potential problem in many different places. But what we don't understand is why some people get infected and others don't, even swimming or in the same sort of areas. We, we just know very little about, about it. We do know, as you said, that the route of getting infected appears to always occur through the nose, some water being forced up the nose either by neti pot or swimming, uh, and then the amoeba accesses the brain by going across, along the nerves up into the frontal part of the brain, and that's where it starts to do its damage. Right. Now, there is an investigational drug. It's called miltefacin, and uh, I think it's approved for treating another parasite, leishmaniasis. Um, miltefacin is an interesting drug. It was actually an anti-cancer drug right. in, the, in the early stages of, of trials, and it was found by another investigator to, to work pretty well against uh, visceral leishmaniasis. And then later... Uh, Dr. Vishveshvar and other colleagues at CDC found out that it was also active against the amoeba. Right. Now, why do you, I'm, I'm kind of piggyback on the first uh, question. Why do you think mil has been has not been very effective in saving the lives of several of these patients? The well, is it timing? or? I, it's, it's a hard thing because the most of these cases, uh, by the time the drug gets to them, well, first of all, it's difficult to diagnose. Most of the time, the doctor is looking at a viral meningitis or bacterial meningitis as the etiology of, of the infection, and then only after they rule out all of those do they usually come to the fact that it's actually caused by an amoeba. Mm -hmm. Now, that's becoming less rare in places like Florida where where uh, people are being, the docs are being encouraged to ask about warm water exposure in two weeks prior to that. So that's the first problem is very late diagnosis or many times not even diagnosed until after the patient has is, is, is died and they do an autopsy. The second thing is we don't know that much about how these drugs work. And in our experiments in the lab, miltefacin does work, but it takes quite a long time for it to kill the amoeba effectively. So the onset of action is not as rapid as what we probably need to see with an organism that causes such a, a high fatality rate so quickly. Is there any evidence that um, there's different, let's say, strains of the amoeba, which are, some are more virulent than others? Is there any evidence of that? There, there are a few other uh, species of Negleria that have been shown to be pathogenic in mice. Uh, to my knowledge, those haven't been shown in, in people. Uh, it's always been Negleria fowleri. But as I said, we don't know enough about the organism, how much variability there is, and if that's one source of the problem is variability in, in the response to these drugs. Yeah. All right, let, let's go ahead and uh, switch gears and talk about your work over at USF. And essentially, your lab is on a mission uh, to come up with an effective treatment, and you're screening countless compounds in search of a cure. Can you go ahead and tell my audience, what are you guys doing over at USF? 
Yes, we're we're trying several approaches. Uh, the first one is um, we know that we can use uh, an approach called phenotypic screening, and that's where you basically take the the organism, the parasite you're trying to kill, you put it in a tissue culture dish, and you put the drug on top of it and see what happens. That approach has been very successful in in, in other organisms like malaria, which my lab also works on quite a bit and other infectious diseases. So when we started this project a couple of years ago, when we started, there was really no high throughput screening method being used to test drugs against the parasite. Most investigators would take four, five, six drugs that were already on the market and test them in these long, laborious studies in the lab. So we adapted some of this technology so we could do high throughput screening in 384 well plates and be able to do thousands of compounds in even 72 hour period. So by using those tools, we then said we can do two things. First of all, we had some compounds that we knew had some potential for activity. And so I went to a, a really good chemist, David Boykin at Georgia State University that specialized in this kind of compound we started working together. We were able to rapidly screen through 2,000 different types of analogs with his compounds and identify some unique ones that are very, very potent against the parasite. Oh, good. So now we have to modify those to make them into a drug that can cross the blood-brain barrier and actually kill the amoeba. The, the second part of the process is using the same approach, but now going to find new compounds that we don't have any idea would be active. And one good place to look for those are in natural products, these secondary metabolites that come from fungi and other organisms. And we've been very successful with a small company, Mycosynthetics, out of North Carolina, Cedric Pierce and Bill Baker, a natural products chemist here at USF. And we've screened over 30,000 of, of their extracts, and we've had a very nice hit rate, and we have some exciting new potential chemicals that we can start to work on and turn those into the same process I told you before where we optimize it for a drug. Okay, so uh, you haven't got as far as long as actually having uh, drug candidates being tested yet? We do. We, oh, you do? We have, we have some that are actually in mouse studies. Uh, we're starting those mouse studies now. Okay. And we're hoping that those will be able to, to show that they're active in vivo. We do have very, very potent compounds that kill the organism in vitro. And one of the other things uh, that goes back to your comment about miltefacine, we've been focusing on compounds that not only kill the organism, but act very rapidly. So we're trying to find something that within the first 12 to 24 hours will really kill the amoeba quickly because with this fatal infection, the rapid onset, sure. we really need something that works quickly and that can be used in combination with the other drugs. Okay. Now, in your work for trying to find a treatment for Niglaria, uh, are you also looking at looking for treatments for the other free-living amoeba, the Balamuthias and all that? We are not personally working on Balamuthia yet. We have been talking to the CDC about working with them on that part of the project. But we do have a very active uh, program on Acanthamoeba. Okay. That's the organism that can cause the same sort of symptoms but in a chronic disease called granulomatous amoebic encephalitis right, right. or can cause a keratitis in people who, who get uh, contact lenses that are not clean or scratch their eye. Mm -hmm. Both of these are very serious diseases. Mm -hmm. And some of the compounds that I mentioned from Dr. Boykin work on both Nagleri and Acanthamoeba, so those are actually quite exciting. Oh, that's great. Fantastic. And w when do you think that um, uh, some of your drug candidates are going to be uh, getting to a point where the next level, the next phase, as far as uh, going beyond treat, uh, testing on mice? Well, the, the real the real difficulty is taking something that works against the organism and actually turning it into a compound that has the drug-like properties that you can give it to somebody. Mm -hmm. So we're working very closely now to try to optimize the compounds we have so that they can retain the activity against the amoeba, but also cross the blood-brain barrier so that they can get to the site where the infection is occurring. and. 
as you know, the blood brain barrier is actually our body's way of protecting our brain from uh, xenobiotics or chemicals or other things that would harm it. So actually getting compounds to go into the brain is actually very difficult. And that's still an inexact science. We have some, some leads that look pretty good. But if we can get to the point where we have in vivo activity in the mouse model, then we can start talking to groups like the CDC and others to do the final steps towards trying to get something into uh, uh, approval for phase one safety trials, make right. sure it works. Not efficacy, but make sure it's safe exactly. to give the people. Well, this work is very, very important. Like you said, despite the very few human cases, uh, this parasite is found in fresh water all over the country, even as north as, I think I saw a case in Minnesota several years ago. So There's been two cases in Minnesota. Yeah. So um, it's making this even more critical. And all right, Dr. Kyle, what I want to do to, for the final question is I just want to give you an opportunity, and I'm actually kind of curious if, what is your lab doing in other fields of drug discovery and parasitology? Most of the work we're working is on malaria. And one of the more exciting things we're doing is uh, trying to eradicate the form that becomes dormant or goes to sleep in your liver. Plasmodium vivax is mm-hmm. transmitted by mosquitoes. When if the mosquito bites, the infected form first goes to your liver And some of those will actually go through development and then go into the blood, and that's where they cause the disease. The real problem is those that stay in the liver and become dormant, they can stay there for weeks or months or years before they come out and cause disease again. So these are the ones that are making it very difficult for us to try to eliminate malaria. So we've developed uh, a new system in collaboration with the Draper Lab here uh, that's now in in the Cambridge but was here at USF, a system to grow primary human liver uh, for up to four weeks and to infect that was a parasite and they'd be able to test that, the new drugs on it. So we've been doing this uh, with funding from the Gates Foundation and we're very excited. We're now working with multiple downstream partners like biotech companies and, and, and pharma companies to try to identify new compounds that will kill those dormant parasites. Excellent. Great. Love to hear it. I'd love to visit your lab sometime. (laughs) Sure. Come on by. All right. All right. Well, Dr. Dennis Kyle, thank you, sir, for your time and expertise. Oh, thank you. All right.